This is a Poke Press Special Report. My name is Stephen. I'm from an organization called Poke Press. Uh, what prompted you to basically write a, uh, an encyclopedia of anime? Is there a particular point where you said this needs to be documented somehow? Were you getting a lot of questions from people? How did that come about? It came, came about in the very, very early days of my fandom in 1981. Um, I started studying anime in 1981. And I'm a public library kid. I was, I was brought up by parents who every time I had a question said, get a book, you know, go look it up. Don't just ask somebody for their opinion. Go look it up and, and get a real authority. So I went to the library and there were no books on anime at all. None, not one. Over two years of research through a huge number of libraries, some very respectable academic libraries like the British Film Institute Library and the British Library, I managed to amass 800 words about anime. And I thought, this isn't going to teach me very much. And it's, it's, it's really obvious that nobody is interested in exploring this thing, so I'd better write a book about it. And in fact, I've just done a whole panel on that um, this morning. I set out to try and persuade publishers to accept the anime encyclopedia because it was the book that I wanted to read, therefore I'd have to write it. And it took me, oh, well it's, it's 33 years this year since I started pitching the book. Um, it actually, the first edition came out in 2001, so if we knock that out it took me 20 years to get the first edition accepted. But finally, I mean, this third edition is really doing most of the jobs that I wanted the book on anime I needed to be able to do. So I think, you know, it's, it's finally got there. It's only taken me 33 years to find the book I wanted on anime. And I had to write it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I figured we could go maybe a step farther back. And uh, how did you first catch the bug? Oh, well, that, 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 that's, that's a very, very familiar story, met a guy. You know, when, when you meet a guy, um, or you meet, you know, your, your partner of whatever gender you choose, there's, there's always a period where you, you're finding out what each other likes, and, you know, you're exploring each other's interests, and you're learning new things. And, and when I met Steve, he'd just got back from a post-graduation trip to Europe, and he'd been to the Spanish island of Mallorca, and he'd encountered anime in Spanish. And right away, because he, he's an illustrator and his whole group were fine artists, they knew that the cartoons they were seeing, even though they were in Spanish on the hotel TV, were not the same as the cartoons that they were seeing that had been made in Spain. They could see there was a visual difference. So they came back, having scoured the town for everything they could find, knowing that these were robot cartoons made in Japan. And when he showed them to me, I was astounded, because at that point I read no Japanese, and I also read no Spanish. But I could follow the videos, I could follow the comics purely from the strength of the narrative imagery. And as, as a storyteller myself, that absolutely fascinated me. And I thought, we have to find out more. And then we run into this black brick wall that nobody knew anymore. And when somebody says to me, um, it's better if you don't go there because nobody's really interested, I kind of get a says who reaction and, and start digging. So that was really where it all began. Um, was there any particular show that caught your eye back then? Or? Well, obviously Mazinger Z, because that was the first one, but when we started, um, we had a lot of friends in Star Trek fandom, and through them I was already trading videotapes, so I managed to amass quite a bit of video. And the first show that really got me was Zeta Gundam. Um, Steve loved it because it had great big zonking heavy robots. I loved it because it starred an Aryan blonde in shades. There was an annoying kid, but there's always an annoying kid. You can kind of try and get over that. Um, and I, the thing that I loved most about Gundam was the idea that all of man's ills and sorrows and dangers are man's own fault. And I loved that, that nugget of realism and truth in, in this whole fantastic universe. It was just great. Uh, well, taking that to uh, a more realistic level, um, how you, you've been watching fandom for such a long time. How has fandom changed and evolved, and how does that fit in with what you're talking about, how it's all, it's all people? Um, it's interesting because British fandom, French fandom, but European fandom, American fandom have all evolved in slightly different ways up till the turn of the millennium. And the thing that made the difference was readily available cheap broadband. That has changed the fandom universe. That is the big change. I mean, obviously, um, improvements in video technology help a lot. When we used to trade tapes back in the day when you, you stuck cassettes of essentially sellotape with iron filing in your video, 
and you hope that you get a good transfer on it. Um, there were an awful lot of complications to trading tapes. There were a lot of complications to getting tapes to each other. Back then it could take months. You know, people, people would excitedly tell you that their friend in Japan was taping something off TV for them. And every week the video cassette would go in the post and, or every month when it was full up and everybody that person knew would be waiting for it to arrive. Fandom was so local. Fandom was like a series of little medieval villages dotted in a great dark forest. And now, of course, fandom's global and instantaneous, and a multi-headed monster that's doing its best to devour the, the, the entirety of the body of the thing it loves. But broadband has been the change. Fandom hasn't been the change. Because people can do things, generally they will do things. Uh, you were a good example of this. You mentioned, obviously, you'd start with Star Trek and, and moved over to anime. There seems to be a pretty good correlation between the fan bases and interest between science fiction and anime. Uh, why, why do you think that is? Well, I think Star Trek, particularly more than science fiction and anime, because Trek was an incredibly woman-friendly fandom. Trek was, it was a female-dominated fandom from its inception. I mean, you know, we let you guys play in our sandbox. <laughs> uh, and guys were very welcome as Trek fans, and some guys were very influential Trek fans, but one of the interesting phenomena about Trek fandom is right from the word go, it was a fandom where women led. Whereas science fiction fandom, right from the word go way back in the 30s when it really got off the ground, was a male-led fandom where girlfriends and wives were allowed to come along, providing they didn't try and pretend they knew anything. And British fandom was still in that state in 1974 when I went to my first convention. There were six women at my first convention. Um, one of them was another woman who was there because she loved science fiction, and the other were females attached to other guys. Um, and that was, was very strange. And one of the, the great um, changes in my early fanish life was that Trek fandom and media fandom flooded SF fandom. And although there was initially a, a good deal of resistance to this cultural immigration, when everybody finally settled down and, and got together, everybody realized that the two fandoms had enriched each other. But I think anime fandom follows Trek fandom far more than it follows classic SF, at least in the West, in that it has always been a profoundly female-friendly fandom. Now, if you look at some other fandoms, say gaming fandom, sadly, gaming fandom is not especially female-friendly because the material on which gaming band fandom bases itself is not especially female-friendly. And the attitude of some gaming fans is totally rejecting and disrespectful of women. Um, now, that's not to say that there's no disrespect for other genders and differences that comes up in anime fandom. There is. But generally speaking, the weight of female influence in anime fandom is strong enough to neutralize that and most guys who are anime fans are not such total dorks that they let that happen sadly and i don't want to diss gaming fans too much because i know some lovely gaming fans most guys in gaming fandom it seems are such total dorks that they're willing to let that happen and i think you know maybe we need a revolution ladies maybe we need to take over gaming fandom but to be honest i haven't got time well, as long as we're on the topic with the gender and the fandoms, uh, I figure this is just kind of a natural progression. Uh, what do you know, or have you heard anything about this uh, My Little Pony thing in the past couple of years? Um, which, which particular one? Because I've heard quite a bit about My Little Pony things. I mean, there's the brony issue, of course, yes. which I think is lovely. I mean, for guys to embrace their inner plushie, I think is a wonderful <laughs> thing. Yeah. Um, and, but the thing that disturbs me a bit about, about My Little Pony at the moment is, is this, this range of dolls, and I understand there's a rationale for it within um, ponydom, but there's a range of dolls in which the ponies are embodied as prepubescent leggy girls. Wow, have we ever seen that idea before? Um, and apparently there is a justification for it in, in, in game, as it were, that one of the ponies goes through into an alternate universe where she's a girl and all her friends happen to be there as girls. Why don't any of them transmigrate into boys? You know, that's, that's, that's the weird thing. Yeah, but, but um, now I, I think, you know, pony fandom's been quite positive, especially with the brony outpouring, because it's, it's encouraged people to acknowledge that they like soft, cute, pretty things, and they quite like to be a soft, cute, pretty thing now and then, and that's, that's fine, that's cool. Sorry, um, oh, okay. anime has such a range, such a range. Um, you know, my little brother um, loves the uh, slice of life type anime. I'm much more the uh, big zonking robot type yeah. anime guy. And it always surprises me that they can all come together at one convention mm -hmm. and that it blends so well. Yeah. Uh, has, does that ever, does that surprise you or does it just mm -hmm. seem logical to you? 
It's absolutely logical. I mean, you know, people who fly big zonking robots, we often forget from because of the mythology and the iconography of most robot shows, people who fly big zonking robots are usually estranged from their families or torn out of their family group or in some other way dumped into this strange universe and the robot becomes their friend and they have to cope with it. But there are a lot of robot anime where the big zonky robots are the product of a family group. I mean, look at all Gona Guy's anime. Most, fair enough, most of his families are pretty dysfunctional. But they're still families and they hang together and they care for each other and they look out for each other. And the fact that, you know, a couple of them happen to pilot giant robots or the rest of the backup crew is just, you know, that's just the day job. It's the family. Gatchaman. The, the main thing about Gatchaman is that they become a family. And I think one of the things that strikes me as really encouraging about anime is that all through it there runs this thread that it can be really hard to find your place in the world. It can be really hard to find that place where you feel comfortable and you feel accepted and you're willing to accept others. But that there is a place for everybody. You know, even if your thing is driving zonking great giant robots, or even if your thing is you know, being a little creature with a horn and lots of sparkles. You could find your place in the big world by just finding the family that you fit best in and then using that as a base. Um, did you have like any favorite panels? Like you've been to so many conventions, like oh, one well, that stuck out to you a lot? Crispin Freeman is always awesome to watch. <laughs> I think my favorite panels are the ones I get to do with Crispin. I really enjoy them. Um, I like, I love smart people. Being around smart people makes you smarter. And when you come to conventions, you get a lot of smart people. Some of them are smart in very different ways. And what I really like in a panel is finding a subject that I don't know much about, maybe that I've never heard of before, but that's presented in such an engaging way. I've just come from Charles Dunbar and Catriel Page's um, Shinigami panel, Study of Anime. That was amazing. That was so scholarly and so punchy and so well presented. That, that really, really thrills me. But I also love making panels. I love panels that are hands-on and that say, I'm going to teach you the techniques, I'm going to teach you the tools. So I did a haiku panel last time, and that was great fun. I love to see craft panels. I love the cosplay panels. I love to see model-making panels and construction panels. They're all the best. I mean, what this is, is this is the opportunity for all of us to go to a really great play school for the weekend. And whether we're playing with ideas or we're playing with art or we're playing with, with fabric, we're here with a load of other people who just want to play and don't think it's stupid and don't think it's crazy and don't say, what's that going to do for your grades? <laughs> although people learn study skills here better than they do in school. And don't say, that's not going to get you a job, although people have got jobs here. We just say, you want to play, that's fine. Come play with us. And I love that. I just adore that. Uh, very briefly, uh, since Cataloging all the anime must have been a tremendously daunting task, and obviously you had to rely on resources from Japan. You know, what do you think was your best resource to get information about some of these, especially the more obscure shows? My best resource was my co-author, Jonathan Clements. Jonathan is brilliant. Jonathan is funny and clever, and you, re you guys really ought to get him over here sometime. I mean, how many people have you got who learned their Mandarin listening to their father play jazz sax in a Chinese restaurant in Essex <laughs> and then went on to be an associate professor in a Chinese university? Um, Jonathan's great. I, I love working with him. But obviously, the internet is a huge resource for us, not for what's on it itself, but for the connectivity it provides. You can actually, through the internet, contact somebody within a couple of days who maybe has a senior position in Kyoto International Manga Museum or one of the universities there whom you couldn't contact by letter in less than a couple of months and there would have been a good deal of awkwardness. But now thanks to the fact that, that the internet makes <coughs> communication so easily, even if somebody doesn't write, write and read English and my Japanese is nowhere near good enough for a senior academic to, 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 to deal with, we can still work it out because things are quicker. So really, the greatest resource we have has been the internet, but not for the information on it, for the contact you can make through it. It's still, um, it's still a fairly wild kid, this internet thing, isn't it? It's, uh, and by the way, we should all remember, and please remember to take this down, we should all give thanks to my countryman, whom I'm very proud of, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who had the idea for the internet, worked out how to make it work, and then gave it away gave it to everybody for free because he thought this is just too important for me to hang around trying to make money for myself out of. 
let's just give it away. And I'm, I'm just so proud of him for that. I'm so proud to come from the same nation. And they honored him greatly at the Olympics. For yes, he deserved it. He really did deserve it. He's a great guy. And, and you know, just imagine that idea, the idea that changes the world. And what do you do? You just say, okay, everybody, play with this. Have it. It's free. It's yours. It's too much, too much fun to keep. That's great. That, that whole attitude is, is what I think we embody at Anime Cons. Play with this because we want to share it. And we should have more of that. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this has been a Poke Press special report.